Hello, welcome to Friday's ESPN FC Live. My name is Mark Donaldson, and alongside me, Luis Miguel Echegaray, and we start nowhere else but the fact that I haven't had enough time, LME, to put on my I Survived the 2024 Earthquake in the northeast of the United States. I, that's, I wanted to begin there, MD. Like, are you okay? Everything oh, oh, fine? Because Earthquake X, Earthquake Twitter went insane for about 20 minutes. My daughter's Lego castle is kind of, <laughs> it, it survived just, but we're okay here. And thankfully, no harm done to anybody following the New Jersey 4.8 earthquake this morning. Coming up on today's show, Manchester United against Liverpool. We're going to spend a fair chunk of time looking back before we even look forward to what on earth happened at Stamford Bridge to Manchester United on Thursday night before we even get into how to preview the game against Liverpool on Sunday and plenty th other things as well. But before we start our chat, let's hear from two people who are far more important than either of us, the managers of Manchester United and of Liverpool. We're going to start with Jurgen Klopp because they had a, a nervy one as well against Sheffield United. Let's hear from both managers. I don't know when we will face next time like a similar challenge. So probably all the other games are now different, especially the next the next one. So um, yeah, we uh, but super positive. The boys coming on, Clark is back. So Robbo trained now. I don't know exactly three days or so back. Really helpful. Harvey. Cody not out, but a really good game which he needed as well. So um, really pleased, and um, that helps. Obviously, nobody got injured if, as far as I know today. Um, so recovery started already. You know, we recover. I don't know what it is, but what it is huh, is that you have to do your job, and they know their jobs, and then you have to make the right decisions. And they didn't make the right decision. There was uh, we didn't react quick enough. Uh, to avoid this situation. On decision making, we have to make better decisions. And in, it's our strength. And you saw how, again how we score uh, from counters. Uh, we, are, uh, we can be such a massive threat. And we have seen today again an example uh, how we, with tempo, uh, we can beat our opponents. Uh, we are unstoppable. But we have to read when to keep the ball. And especially when you are winning, huh? then keep the ball and pass and move and switch the play instead of giving the ball away or going into only long balls. Huh? But bring the ball to opponent's half, keep passing, uh, uh, discourage uh, the, the, the opponent. Uh, but then if you have to defend, you have to do it proper. Huh? And we make that the wrong decisions and on individual errors, you, you lose the game. But that is very frustrating if you're playing such... Uh, a good game. Okay, where to begin? So part of me, LME, thinks it's a good thing. They're right back into action on Sunday, trying to kind of rectify the wrongs. But then they've got Liverpool now. They beat them in the FA Cup recently. They've beaten them more recently as well in the league prior to that. But Liverpool have won 5-0 there two and a half years ago. So Normally, I'd ask you a question as if to say, where do you want to start? But we have to start at Stamford Bridge. What went wrong? <laughs> First of all, <laughs> that game was insanity. It was the uh, Premier League football version of Heath Ledger's Joker's head popping out of the police car window in, in, in Batman. It was just insane. So what went wrong? You can go either way, MD, either with Chelsea Football Club, which are not right now a sustainable decently consistent squad under Mauricio Pochettino as the table has shown against the Manchester United side who even though are better in the table still in the FA Cup also show a lot of weaknesses but from a Manchester United perspective 28 shots conceded that's 107 total in the last four matches and they were leading this game despite all of that they were leading this game in stoppage time and all they had to do, as Eric Ten Hag said, was just be smart, keep the ball, possession, control, 
And it all just completely fell apart. Mm -hmm. And Eric Ten Hag has mentioned that individual errors cost them this game. But I ask this to Eric Ten Hag, MD. If every individual error, first of all, every error, first of all, is individual. It like how it happens is comes down to either focus or or collective focus, depending what you're seeing. And yesterday was an abomination of how you mess this up as a football club. And that all falls down to Eric Ten Hag, because guess what? This kind of similar pattern happened against Brentford as well. So this is not just like a one-off. And when you are in this situation, I mean, commendable to come back from 2 nothing down, bring it back, and then 3-2. But when you're in a situation and you're in stoppage time, ready to just kill this game off, you literally did everything possible to give away the goal. And that corner, by the way, the last goal by Cole Palmer, which, by the way, tremendous performance from him once again. But how, like, please, Manchester mm. United fans, Eric Ten Hag, anybody with the club, look at the tape of how you defended that corner. It was amateurish. It was horrific. And they deserve everything. So, yes, Eric Ten Hag can talk about individual errors as much as he wants, but it all falls down to him. And now comes Liverpool Football Club. So we'll have to see what happens. Mm. But it was horrific. Uh, from Man United yesterday, but it was amazing for the neutral, obviously. Let's rewind the clock a little bit before the corner that led to Cole Palmer's hat-trick yeah. and led to Chelsea winning. They'd just conceded a penalty. They'd just conceded an equaliser from that. They start the game, Manchester United. So again, it's keep the ball, keep a point, it's not what you're after. But Chelsea ended up with either a 5-on-4, a 4-on-3, or a 4-on-4. And it looked, they had bodies. They went the wrong way. They went left instead of going right. Now, they went left. The deflected shot had Onana scrambling and went behind. And you thought, oh, United are lucky there. They could have lost this game. Then they did from that. Now, it's important because it's easy for a pilot on Manchester United or any top team when they're struggling. It's easy just to, to kick them while they're down. Yes, they've got injuries. Yes, they made a, a few changes as well. I don't think that's any excuse whatsoever for what we saw because you've got guys like McTominay and others that have come on. It's not like you're bringing on a competition winner from the Manchester Evening News to go and defend. That wasn't good enough. So how, in the short space of time, 72 hours, in fact, even less than that, between the two games at Chelsea and at home to Liverpool, how does Eric Ten Hag suddenly flip the switch? I'm not sure you flip it that way. Or toss the coin or do whatever he needs to do to make sure that there's focus and those individual errors don't happen. I think it's all down to the fundamentals. And I know that that sounds so simplistic in the answer. But really, when you watch Manchester United, specifically throughout this season, the fundamentals are not there. As you mentioned, the decision-making from Manchester United yesterday was horrific, not to mention the work that they were doing off the ball. When you play Liverpool Football Club, who, by the way, I know we're going to get into it now, and I want your thoughts on this one as well. I see a team as well that even though they beat Sheffield United, they didn't look that great. So there is an opportunity to do something. So the most important thing, first of all, right, is to control their midfield. Because once Chelsea kept coming at you in the final third, there were gaps, mountains, Grand Canyon openings for Chelsea to just penetrate, specifically once the ball was lost. Liverpool's going to do the exact same thing. So what, what do you do here? Do you start Scott McTominay making sure that you strengthen that midfield? Do you perhaps make sure that Marcus Rashford, if he starts, also commits defensively? That hasn't been the case this season. Garnacho can be wonderful, but he can also be erratic. So all these fundamental things need to make sure that they're essentially consistently proven against Liverpool. Keep the ball is the most important thing. And when you're defending a set piece, MD, for crying out loud, do your job. I mean, what do you think they need to do? Because at this point, we're talking about a team in April. This isn't November. This yep. isn't like January after the Christmas break, even though there isn't one. This isn't after the February break. Or into, this is April, and there's no more matches left. So what else can you do? You've got to go back to the fundamentals, surely. I, I don't know if they're buying into what Eric Ten Hag's saying. Because if they are, they would focus, and they wouldn't switch off. Now, Casemiro yesterday, when they were 2-0 down, let's not forget about this. this th let's not talk about them when they were 3-2 up because Enric Ten Hag's right. They scored good breakaway goals. They scored excellent finishes. Good ball in from Anthony for... He was good once again. Yeah, yeah but, but what, once in a blue moon isn't enough. I mean, he's still got this tag as a YouTube footballer. Yes, he's finally got his assist, but 
his price tag has not helped him. So are you You've blaming got, Eric Ten Hag more than, this, than the individuals? I, this is a blame culture that we live in. So hmm. everybody's got to take a share of the blame. Eric Ten Hag might be doing all he, all he is, but are the players listening to him? If you're Marcus Rashford and you're dropped, can he have any real complaints that he's been dropped this season? No, not really. But then Eric Ten Hag says, okay, he's not been dropped, but we want him to come on for the last half hour or, or whatever and to have an impact. Right, it's, it's a squad game here. But it's a culmination of things. The problem they have got now is they've got three days, now two days, to fix the issues. It ain't going to be fixed. So if they lose against Liverpool on Sunday, regardless of what happens to Spurs and Villa, and even if it's the top five that get into the Champions League next season, United aren't getting top five, are they? No, no. I had them dead already before the Liverpool game. And if they lose to Liverpool 100%, I mean, Sheffield United have allowed uh, more shots against per game this season uh, than United. That's it. United is the next one after that. And if you're trying to get the Champions League, including a fifth place spot with those kind of statistics, forget about it. And I think that if you don't get anything out of Liverpool, and I'm talking maybe even a victory because you're 11 points away from Aston Villa in fourth place, nine points away from Tottenham in fifth place. You still got the FA Cup semi-finals to play. You still got to play Arsenal. You still got to play Newcastle. And even in the last game of the season away at Brighton, that could be Roberto De Servi's final game with Brian. We don't know. But, you know, going away in the final day of the season is never easy for the opposing player. There's no way it's happening. So here's a question to you, like, First of all, do you think they're going to get anything out of Liverpool? Second of all, surely this is it. That game yesterday surely was curtains for Eric Ten Hag, no? Eric Ten Hag can't continue next season because it's not just a case of let's have a turnover of players. Let's get 10 in and we'll get 10 out. You can't do that. The wages that these Manchester United players are on, the contracts that these players are on, this needs right from the top. You've started to see with the investment now of Sir Jim Ratcliffe with David Brailsford coming in as well. You're starting to th see things happen. A lot of talk about what's going to happen next season as well. That cannot continue with Eric Ten Hag at the helm. Is Eric Ten Hag a bad coach? No. He might be the right coach for Manchester United, but not at this time. So it's in his best interests if he goes something somewhere else. And for me, it's in Manchester United's best interests if Manchester United have a new coach next season who comes in with fresh ideas, whether it's ruthless or whatever it is. They need change. Now, Liverpool. Mohamed Salah taking off just before the hour mark. Great for us fantasy Premier League captainers on when, uh, Thursday against Sheffield United. I captain Cole Palmer, MD, so I'm fine. Uh, well, I, I, do you know what? If you were to take off a Bruno, and then I'm yeah. thinking who else is Manchester United's best player, then it might be a bit of a gamble. But you look at that, and Jurgen Klopp knows what he's doing. Okay, Was it a gamble to take off Mohamed Salah? Well, let's ask that question if they don't win that game. They did. And it's not about being pretty at this stage of the season. It's about moving on with three points in the bag. He's now refreshed. He's now got a point to prove against a United defence that's got all these injuries. I mean, give me as much more. So make him your fantasy Premier League captain this weekend. And I think he'll reward you. What do you reckon? <laughs> I, I definitely, because when he got off in the 60th minute, he was not a happy bunny. Nope. But I think uh, Jurgen Klopp had every right to take him off. Liverpool needed an Alexis McAllister banger to reclaim the lead in the 76th minute. Despite the possession, despite the shots, Sheffield United were one all against Liverpool at home who are trying to win the Premier League. That, to me, is a certain level of alarm bells, specifically at Come right on, now. They won, they won the game. The what, what, what are you after here? The Sheffield United had that really early chance. Then they had the goal, which was off Connor Bradley. They won the game by three goals to one. Because yesterday uh, we were talking about the strength of schedule and the remaining schedule that people have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Liverpool are going to play tougher teams. And yes, United are a mess, but they're stronger than Sheffield United. I think my point is this. If they want to win this Premier League, they got to do better than that. Because 3-1 flattered them. It was 1-0. They needed a bang McAllister banger to get it to 2-1. And then 3-1 at the end. It's three points. Are they facing an easier game now? at Old Trafford, with the way that Manchester United defend, and that home support that will urge them forward, are they going to have more opportunities like they had against Brighton, where Salah could have scored five or six goals? He was anonymous. Well, here's could my this problem, be the though, game for him this weekend? Well, here's the problem that I have with that. I think that it's going to, obviously, because the answer is yes, because United are very vulnerable. But here's the thing. If we judged anything from what we saw against United in the FA Cup, and, you know, they lost 4-3, Liverpool were leading in that game, Mm -hmm. In the 85th minute, 
-hmm. And then they did the exact same errors that United did yesterday against Chelsea. Not blueprint copy by copy, but they were very lackadaisical, specifically when losing the ball after going forward. So it's just a warning sign for Liverpool is my point. Like if you want to keep going and you want to get something out of United, who, by the way, obviously Eric Ten Hag is going to be on United at home to make sure they get something out of it right? They just need to be better than what they should against Sheffield United. That's all I'm saying. But I, I take your point. I think Salah is going to be more than up for this because he was not happy to come up in the 60th minute, but it was proven justifiably because they won at the end. It's actually a proper dichotomy, this one, because it could be the perfect game for United. The last thing they want is a, a Sheffield United at home or someone like that that's got no real interest in, in having a go, just sitting back, low block, United struggling, fans getting on their back. So that in essence, could make it an ideal game for Manchester United. Because Are you leaning one way or home. another? No, no, no. I'm leaning Liverpool. But yeah. I'm just painting the picture here. I'm giving you both options and explaining why it could be a good game, that it's a Liverpool game where you don't need the players to get up for it. The fans will be up for it as well. However, on the other hand, it's Liverpool. That 5-0 was only two and a half years ago. That's what they're capable of doing. They can punish. They've got best uh, the best players outside the top three that Manchester United are going to face here. So, it, again, it depends what way you want to look at this one. From a Liverpool perspective, I think they'll be lick, lick, licking even their chops ahead of Sunday. They just have to be better than what they did against Sheffield United. That's all I'm going to say. They just have to put one more on the board than Manchester United. And then we can talk about Champions League, missing out, Man United and whatever. So, let's move on. So, we've got some true or false questions for you. This is a Premier League edition. Now, Rather than me kind of saying true or false and giving you the statement, I'm going to say whether it's true or false. You're going to tell me if you agree with me or you disagree I like with it. me. Jurgen Klopp, number one, he is as important to Liverpool as Sir Alex Ferguson was to Manchester United. I agree with that. What do you say? Yep, I agree completely. Listen up. Fat Man United fans, Liverpool, Klopp is important to Liverpool as Ferguson is born to United. There's no denying what Sir Alex Ferguson, MD, did for Manchester United in the 90s, the legacy, and his shadow continuing to influence any manager that takes over after that. But that's exactly, in terms of identity, what he has done for Liverpool, has Jurgen Klopp done for that club as well? The Champions League, the FA Cup, the Premier League, at an era, by the way, where he had to compete against the super teams in the likes of Manchester City and Pep Guardiola as well. It's a remarkable thing what Jurgen Klopp has done. I've said it a few weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Obviously, there are names that are going to be replacing this person. Somebody has to do it. But for a manager to come in and do what Jurgen Klopp did to not just like enliven that squad and giving them an identity, but the community, the fan base, the entire city, the entire red side of Merseyside, what he has done for that club is just as important as what Ferguson's did for Manchester United. I agree. True. Yeah. Part, part of the fabric. Has he been there as long? No. Has he had to change as many squads as Sir Alex did? No. But he's been such an integral part. And we'll see, like Manchester United fans saw when Sir Alex left, how difficult it is to replace an icon of a football club. Next one, number two, 24 goals conceded, best in the league, Premier League for Arsenal. That, for me, makes Gabriel and William Saliba as the division's best defensive pairing. And if you go back to the first couple of games of the season, Gabriel didn't even start those. He was on the bench. Name a better defensive pairing in the Premier League if you disagree. No, I can't. I agree with you. They are the best pairing in the Premier League by a mile, by the way, not just because of how much they have played together 24 times, but I believe that per statistics, uh, Arsenal now allows 0 0.76 goals uh, per match, which is some of the best numbers that they've given in the last few seasons because of that partnership. I love this partnership because one of them is like very smooth on the ball, sees the game, dancer-esque, and the other one is a warrior. Who just like go at you whenever he can, in your face. When you're attacking corners, he will try and get there. And that's the Saliba and Gabriel partnership. I agree with you. I think it's the best partnership in the Premier League by a mile. I was looking at some of the others, and I really like Van de Ven at Spurs with, with yep. Romero. But Good acquisition. 
Romero's an earthquake waiting to happen, and we've already had one <laughs> today. Um, but well again, just a, a good defender. Um, but look how many goals they've conceded this season, 44. Newcastle last season, Fabian Scher playing alongside Sven Botman, and then LaSalle could come in as well if one of them was hurt. But this season, they've really missed Nick Pope, and defensively, they've been all over the place. So, yeah, we'll go for that as the central defensive number one pairing in the Premier League, Saliba and Gabriel. Number three in this one. Phil Foden is ready to take Kevin De Bruyne's starting position as that central 10. I think that Phil Foden comes into his own, and we saw that at the start of the season when Kevin De Bruyne was out. How do you therefore fit both Phil Foden centrally and Kevin De Bruyne centrally? I think it's very difficult. So, of course, he's ready to take on Kevin De Bruyne's position. But are you allowing that because you're going to get rid of Kevin De Bruyne? No. So you've got to come up with a way. And it's working all right just now. But how do you fit them both in? Is Phil Foden ready to take Kevin De Bruyne's starting central position? No, not right now. I mean, listen, like, yes, Kevin De Bruyne, including the injury that he suffered this season, has not been the same. He came back in a little bit of that spark, and then he kind of has slowed down a little bit. Clearly, at 33 years old, he's not the player that he was four seasons ago, three seasons ago, even two seasons ago. And yes, Phil Foden is up there in player of the season in any club. But when Kevin De Bruyne is healthy, full on, 100%, this season, you can't leave him out in big games. And I think that's the conundrum that Pep Guardiola has. What a great headache he has. Where do I place each one? And yes, we have seen Phil Foden act more uh, aggressively or be more creatively in that central spot. But you, you have to put De Bruyne in the middle, specifically in those big games, and then allow Phil Foden to maybe ease himself in. Because if you watch Phil Foden in a game, MD, he, even if he goes right, very naturally, instinctively, he just comes centrally. And De Bruyne fits within that. Now, in the future, is that going to be the solution? Who knows? Probably. But Kevin De Bruyne, healthy. This season, you got to start him. you just got to find a way to fit both of them. I think it's at the expense of Julian Alvarez, to be honest with you, at this point. And that's the key. There's no way you're not playing both of them yeah, right now. You, you, you make it work. If you're playing Foden to one side, he's not too bad, that young kid. And it'll be interesting to see what England do, because they've got a plethora of middle-to-front attacking options at the Euros in the summer. Number four in our True or False Premier League Friday version. Roberto Di Serbi is not ready to manage a top-four team in the Premier League. Utter nonsense. Bunkum. remember commentating on him when he was at Sassuolo. Loved the way he played. On the deck, there were goals that were scored that started off with the goalkeeper, and then they moved to the defender, and then within 10 seconds, the ball's in the back of the net, up the other end. He is desperate desperate to play with better players and he's i want him to stay at brighton right now but if he had these better players that could do this as well are you trying to tell me he's not good enough for a manchester city for a liverpool for a manchester united an arsenal or a chelsea or a spurs or an aston villa he would be perfect for a team like liverpool or a side that wants to get the ball down and play so is he good enough for a top four side of course he's good enough for a top four side just not yet I think this is ridiculous to even question this. Like, people need to understand, just like you said. Like, he has been managing clubs that have needed to get every single ounce of his managerial prowess to get them to where they are. Yes, Brighton are a very well-run club, and they also know their limitations, right? But Roberto De Serbi is a tremendous manager who, just like you said, you put him in a top four, a top five club, and my goodness, the things that he could do. Like he, That's why, reportedly, he's being looked at by Liverpool. It might not happen, but he is that good. You just got to give him the plethora, the menu for him to apply. So is he the greatest manager? Is he the complete product, like you said? No, he will keep going there. By the way, when Mikel Arteta first entered Arsenal, like he was questioned to be sacked after seven months, right? Like people quick keep questioning certain managers about their qualities and if they're good enough for that team. Roberto De Servi is a tremendous tactician. I would love to see him in the top four team. Obviously, there's going to be bumps along the road, but he's that good of a manager and he deserves an opportunity if it ever comes. There's an element of snobbery in English football. Yeah. He's not good enough to be a top four manager, 
but he's one of the favourites to take over at Bayern Munich. Yeah, just calm your jets. This is a kid that's destined for the top as a coach, Roberto Di Serbi. But for Brighton fans, I hope he's able to do that with them and enjoy these European runs and get back next season. And we'll see you think he's staying? where that goes. I don't know. I don't know because, look, I love what he's done at Brighton. I loved what he did at Sassuolo. He wasn't great at Shakhtar, but everybody's got a team. If Bayern came calling, I think he'll listen. Yeah. Think, oh, he, of of yeah. course he'd, he'd listen. Now, we've seen with Xabi Alonso, might have had options. He stayed put. Could he be at Brighton next season? Of course he could. Yeah, That's I think my, my only thing about him, MD, is that he he's the kind of manager that really needs to enter an environment that completely supports him. And yes. I mean in the bad and the good. Because I think that there's an Antonio Conte-ish thing about him, right? Where like he needs to make sure that he's entering an environment that say, Roberto, this is, what are we doing? We're going to be here all the way. The moment he sees friction, that's when things can get tricky. So it's important for him to choose the right project. But I'm with you. Stay at Brighton. Keep building something special. The last one for Friday is true or false. I like this one. Manchester City made a big mistake in selling Cole Palmer. Nonsense. How, if we have just spoken about trying to fit Kevin De Bruyne centrally, Phil Foden in there. Where is he going to go? Where are you going to put Cole Palmer in there as well? All that would have done. And I've been watching the Manchester City documentary on Netflix and Palmer's in the changing room during the treble season. And he, he did great when he was called upon. But all you're doing is stifling the ability of a player who's ready to explode. And we've seen that this season. That is a nonsense. Manchester City did a good bit of business. Now, if it was on the continent, they might have done some deal. Okay, we'll give you him for this amount of money. But we've got the buyback clause at this amount of money. I don't know what the particulars are of the deal. But what I do think is that Cole Palmer had to get out of Manchester City if he wanted to play and be the focal point of a team like Chelsea. What do you think? Yes, I completely agree. This is going to be a boring show because we're in agreement in every single one, this one. But I'm totally in agreement with this one. Listen, here, here's a few things. Number one, the thing that you said. Manchester City is the one team that can afford to really allow to do this. Number two, the reason why you're seeing Cole Palmer be so effective this season, aside from the fact that he's a wonderful football player, is because he's in a team that really needs somebody like Cole Palmer, right? Success often comes out of necessity. You watch Cole Palmer for Chelsea, and he does three positions in the space of 20 minutes. He wouldn't do that for Manchester City. He's not even allowed to do that. Pep Guardiola doesn't allow anybody to do that. So there is no way that he could have done what he's doing with Chelsea with Manchester City. Because like you said, there's a Kevin De Bruyne, Phil Foden, Julian Alvarez. They spent a lot of money on him. Erling Haaland dominates a lot of that spatial awareness in the final third. But for Chelsea, Cole Palmer is the deliverer, the creator, and the brain. And he goes almost everywhere. And that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. So this was a win for everybody. I mean, the only loser right now is Chelsea because they, like, the entire team need to do what Cole Palmer is doing. So, no, uh, Man City don't need him, and he's shining because he's in a team that Chelsea that really needs all his assets. Okay, before we preview the games coming up this weekend, a couple of predictions, please. First one, Old Trafford on Sunday, Manchester United against Liverpool. What do you reckon? This is going to be another goal fest, but mm -hmm. Liverpool will learn their lessons faster than United. Liverpool win this 3-2. Oh, come on. That was mine. I'll agree. <laughs> We're fun. agreeing on everything. <laughs> we'll like this. We need someone in to play devil's advocate. 3-2 for, for Liverpool in that one. I agree. There'll, there'll be goals. And there's a big one as well at La Cartuja. It's the Copa del Rey final. It's going to be great whatever happens because Mallorca hasn't won the competition since 2003. And Athletic Club haven't taken the trophy back to Bilbao since 1984. Athletic Club... The favourites, who do you reckon will win and get their hands on this silverware in Spain? Yeah, this is a tricky one because uh, almost everything is pointing for me to go with Athletic Club de Bilbao, especially because I'm just like such a glutton for the Williams brothers and Nico, etc. I think this is going to be a tough one that will probably be very tight and it might even be just a 1-0 to Athletic towards the end of the game. But they win wow. I can't agree with that because we're just agreeing on everyone. I think Athletic Club will win it. I did uh, Mallorca's semi-final. They got through in the end on penalties, but they'll probably adapt the same 5-4-1 formation, whether it's Morici up top or Kyle Lahren, and they'll be hard to beat. 
That'll be a good one. It's live on ESPN Plus this weekend. We'll get to that one in just a second. Coverage beginning at 3.30 on ESPN Plus. Rob Palmer, Stuart Robson with the call on that one. Really looking forward to it. And a double helping of Bundesliga action for you on Saturday morning. I'll be on the call for this one, Union Berlin against Bayer Leverkusen. 40 games this season unbeaten, 13 points clear at the top of the Bundesliga with seven games remaining. They travel to the nation's capital, Bayer Leverkusen, to face Union Berlin. At the same time, there's also Bayern Munich in action. They're on the road as well, and they go to Heidenheim. Coverage begins at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 a.m. out west on ESPN+, Plus, with kickoff in both games at 9.30. There you go, LME. We've kind of been kindred spirits today. See, I'm all happy now. I've got a new lease of life following the earthquake, and not a single mention of hearts today. But I will say, <laughs> Hartford Athletic against Miami FC tomorrow, 2 o'clock Eastern, on ESPN Plus. That's quite the day for you, MD, hey, huh? Never cruising in Miami FC. Double dipping. The only team from Miami, professional sports team. None of that Fort Lauderdale nonsense, <laughs> Misty or whatever. Hartford, Miami is the big one in the afternoon. It is the appetizer for the Copa del Rey final, also on ESPN Plus. Company man here. He is as well. We'll do it again next week. And reminder this weekend, Man United Liverpool, full coverage straight after the game on Sunday. Enjoy your weekend, peeps. Bye for now.